Hello, this is the Mushroom Wizard, and I'm returning once again with another presentation regarding the mushrooms found in Saskatchewan and the ways in which we go about picking those mushrooms and identifying those mushrooms. So today we're going to be looking at the third presentation regarding toxic species found in the province, uh, especially species that in this instance bear a uh, a very strong resemblance to an edible species or a particular edible species so much so that extra precaution should be taken when picking that specific edible. So we'll begin here. This is uh, Dubious Doppelgangers of Saskatchewan. So the genera that we're going to be talking about are Agaricus, Clitocybe, Chlorophyllum, Cortinarius, and Omphalotus. And once again, what you should expect from this presentation, uh, toxic mushrooms that bear uh, a very strong resemblance to specific agarics. Even though the first mushroom here that we'll be talking about bears a resemblance to a ridged fungi. So this is the jack-o'-lantern mushroom. This is Omphalotus alludens, and it bears a very strong resemblance to the chanterelle. Uh, and that is not actually an agaric. It is a ridged fungi. This, the jack-o'-lantern mushroom, however, is an agaric. So that's a hint as to one of the ways in which you can tell these two apart. So the cap of the jack-o'-lantern mushroom is orange to red, or the two colors will be streaked together, kind of darker in the center. Um, you can see that happening here in the photo. It is campanulate, and if you recall, campanulate is kind of like a bell shape with a little bit of an umbo at the top, or else it is convex with that small umbo when young, and then becoming flat and developing a depression at maturity. So you can see that depression here. Uh, so this would be an indicator that this is a more mature mushroom that we're looking at. If you run your fingers across the surface, you'll notice that it is smooth to the touch. The margin is lobed and downturned when young, becoming wavy and more upturned later on. As you can see here, it's no longer downturned, it's just there. And this mushroom can grow very large. It can grow up to about eight inches across in terms of the cap diameter. And uh, usually it's a bit smaller. Usually you could expect five or six inches. Here's a photo of a younger mushroom with the margin still downturned and that little tiny umbo at the top. Here's a size reference for you. Now, if you're familiar with chanterelle mushrooms and you've ever picked them, you can see from this photo just how easily you could mistake one for the other. So the jack-o'-lantern mushroom does not have ridges like the chanterelle. What it has is gills, and those gills are orange in color, they are deeply decurrent. Uh, this photo, not so much, but in other photos, you will see they're running a good ways down the stipe. And uh, that's one of the reasons people mistake one for the other, especially when they're new to the hobby. Uh, the gills are fairly crowded together. There are frequent short gills, so quite a lot of them. And this mushroom produces cream spores. So one like, like I mentioned before, if you're going to pick chanterelles, make sure you're looking for those ridges and make sure that those ridges are deeply forked. The stipe is various shades of orange streaked together and kind of getting a bit lighter at the base and darker with darker orange from the gills up at the, uh, the apex. Uh, it is cylindrical, so basically the same width throughout its length. It has a central to an eccentric attachment to the cap. So if you recall, an eccentric attachment would be off center. Uh, as you can see, the one there on the left hand side looks to be a bit off center, whereas the one on the right hand side looks like it's attaching in a more central manner. Uh, the stipes are solid. Uh, several stipes will often join together at the base uh, as this is a clumping mushroom and they will form a single basal mass and you saw that happening uh, to some extent in the size reference photo. Now these grow up to about five inches long and one inch thick. So again a fairly good sized mushroom. 
Now, the ecology is um, one of the best ways to tell the difference between a chanterelle and a jack-o'-lantern. Uh, jack-o'-lanterns are saprobic. They grow directly upon decaying hardwoods, and sometimes they'll also grow upon dead root systems. Uh, and as a result, they'll appear terrestrial, but uh, a little bit of inspection at the base and you'll realize that they are actually attached to wood. And they are preferential uh, very much to oak. So chanterelles, if you recall, are actually mycorrhizal. So they will not grow off of wood like what you're seeing here. So that's a dead giveaway. Uh, also chanterelles do not clump together like this. So that's another another important feature to remember. And in terms of how, how uh, widespread this is in the province, um, it's not very common. Being preferential to oak, you would maybe see this in the cities and you would uh, see this possibly along the Manitoba border uh, in the south, uh, especially in the uh, Quapel Valley. That, that would be a place where you would see that because that's where Baroque uh, predominantly occurs. And they're very gregarious. They clump together in large groups like you can see here and chanterelles really don't do that. And these are found late summer through fall. So the same time as chanterelles, but there are some key differences that you can look out for to keep yourself safe with this mushroom. Now, the toxicity I would say is dangerous. It contains several mycotoxins, uh, including Eludin S, Eludin M, and uh, muscarin. And if you recall from the edibility versus toxicity, uh, presentation that we did, uh, muscarin can be fatal, especially to people with any sort of heart condition or asthma or any sort of respiratory condition. Uh, also the eludin toxins do cause cellular damage, so there could be long-term effects uh, other than what you get from muscarin from eating these mushrooms. Symptoms upon ingestion would include uh, very colicky cramps, vomiting, uh, diarrhea that lasts for days, uh, as well as any of the muscarin symptoms, which would be things like uh, excessive sweating, salivating, um, if you're pregnant, uh, breast, like lactating, uh, and again, the heart palpitations and the difficulty breathing. And as mentioned already, these are relatively uh, rare in Saskatchewan. The next mushroom we're going to look at is the viscid web cap. This is Cortinarius iodioides. So if you recall, um, our web cap, well, we haven't actually, I haven't actually released it yet, but the web caps that we will look at, most of them will be purple. And one in particular, uh, Cortinarius iodes uh, is a dead ringer for this mushroom. So the cap of the viscid web cap is purple, developing streaks of yellow with age. And you can see that actually happening right in the photo here, as this is already uh, a flattened mushroom. It is convex when young, flattening out with age, though usually not completely flat. So we can say that this is a mature mushroom that we're looking at. It's kind of got that sort of pillow appearance where it's, it's flat, but it's still at the margins, rolls down a bit. It is slimy to the touch, very, very slimy. Um, it will have a very thick slime veil. The margin is downturned at first, becoming smooth or appendiculate. And what it becomes appendiculate with is not veil fragments, but cortina fragments, so very wispy, hairy fragments. Then up to about two inches in diameter in terms of its size, so not a very big mushroom. Here's a size reference for you. And you can even see that slimy sheen in, in the photo here. The gills are lilac, becoming rusty brown with age. Uh, they are adnexed, so they reach across and then dip down to some extent before they touch the stipe. They are close together. Short gills are frequent. You can see three to four between each gill there. 
Uh, and then they're, like I've already mentioned, they're covered with a cortina when young. And if you recall, a cortina looks very much like a spider web uh, that's, that's covering those gills and protecting them when they are immature. And this produces a rust colored spore print. And you'll be able to see that around the, uh, around the rim, not, not, not the rim, but around the diameter of the, the stipe there. You can kind of see it starting to happen in this mushroom here. So the stipe is off-white, covered with a sheath of purple slime. It is clavate, so that's more of a club shape where it's a bit wider at the base and then uh, slimmest at the apex. It has a central attachment to the cap. And then again, there's that rust-colored ring zone, and you can see it very clearly here. And you can also see from that ring zone little fragments of the cortina. And then it's up to about two inches high. So these are mycorrhizal with hardwoods and very much preferential to oak once again. So that's where you will find this mushroom. Um, unfortunately, that is the same uh, preference of Cortinarius iodes. And as I already said, they have almost the exact same features. And we'll talk here on the next slide a bit how to determine between one and the other. Uh, this mushroom is solitary to scattered so you're never going to find like a large clump of them. And these are found in the fall in Saskatchewan. The toxicity is moderate. Uh, some Cortinarius are lethally toxic. That is not the case here. Uh, this, this is still, however, moderately uh, toxic with gastrointestinal symptoms. It has a bitter taste to the slime. So that's um, a key feature here. And for most people, they're not going to want to pick Cortinarius iodes, which is the edible mushroom that this so closely resembles. Uh, because the way in which you determine one from the other is you have to lick the slime. The slime of the viscid web cap is quite bitter. The slime of the purple web cap is not. And that is the difference between the two. So if that's something you're into, slime licking, then that's how you have to do it. You gotta really love mushrooms for that one. So the next species that we will be looking at is called the vomiter, for a good reason, and this is Chlorophyllum molybdites. And this bears an uncanny resemblance to the parasol mushrooms and to the shaggy parasol mushroom. So in terms of the cap, it is off-white, tanning with age. It is spherical, becoming convex, and then flattening out with age to some extent, though often never fully flat. Uh, it is fibrillose. It has large, raised, dark brown scales, as you can see there, which are concentrically arranged, but uh, very much solid and still together in the center. If you recall from the uh, Lawn Lovers presentation, Often mushrooms, um, other, other chlorophylla mushrooms like the shaggy parasol will almost have like a solid, large, uh, hardened scale when young, which sort of breaks apart as it expands and grows. Uh, the margin is smooth to appendiculate. And when I say appendiculate, once again, I mean fragments of the veil hanging down uh, from the partial veil. And then sometimes the margin will split in places as it flattens out. And this mushroom can get very large. It can grow up to about nine inches in diameter, though it is usually smaller, more around five to six. Here we have some size references for you. So there's a smaller one on the left and the one that's I would say is probably about six inches on the right. Now here is uh, the easiest way to tell a mature or maturing specimen from its uh, much sought after lookalikes. Uh, and that is through the gills. They are cream to begin with, turning green with maturity. And we don't really see many green gilled mushrooms, right? The only other one I can think of off the top of my head is another toxic one, which was the sulfur tuft, if you recall. Um, so that green color is, is, is a dead giveaway in this mushroom. Uh, 
The gills are free from the stipe. They are crowded together, very crowded. Short gills are present, though they're hard to see here. You can see them a bit on the left, top left there. Uh, and then this is covered with a relatively thick partial veil when young. You can see the, the ring left over from it there. And then this has a green spore print. So if you recall, even the sulfur tuft does not have a green spore print despite having green gills. So this is the only mushroom I know of with a green spore print. I'm sure there are others, but not here and not of interest to us. So doing a spore print often doesn't get you to species. Usually it just gets you to genus. Uh, but this is kind of the, uh, the situation where that's, that's not the case. This is the uh, exception to the rule. I'm going to move on here. There's the spore print that we're talking about. So that's what you can expect from this mushroom. And there's another way to tell the difference between these two, and I'll get to that here with the stipe. So um, this mushroom is has a stipe that is off-white, staining brown with age or with damage. It is, and that's on the, the outside. Uh, it is clavate to bulbous. And if you remember, bulbous is kind of where it's the same uh, width throughout the length of the stipe and then with a kind of a ball at the end. And that's kind of what we're looking at here. You can see, just sort of see the ball there. It has a central attachment to the cap. It is very fibrous. And it's up to about nine inches high and one inch thick at its, at its largest. The annulus is thick and flaring. You can see that there, it's flaring outwards. Then these are saprobic, and they are also terrestrial. And um, they grow on lawns and in grassy areas. So in, in some places, they can be quite frequent. I, I In the south of the province, especially, where it's a bit warmer. And then these grow solitary to gregarious, and they will sometimes form rings. They're found summer through fall. So these are dangerously toxic. They produce severe and prolonged gastrointestinal distress and are also responsible for the majority of non-lethal mushroom poisonings in North America uh, because people are thinking this is a shaggy parasol or a parasol and then they eat it and being such a large mushroom, they get really, really sick. Uh, despite this, there are no, um, no records that I could find of anybody ever dying from a result of eating this mushroom, but I think that's more uh, just a miracle than anything else because it, it can really dehydrate you. The next mushroom we'll be looking at is the frosted funnel. This is Clitocybe phyllophylla. I think I said that right. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So. This mushroom bears a very strong resemblance to um, to other funnel mushrooms, such as the fragrant or funnel uh, or the robust funnel mushroom. Uh, quite a lot of mushrooms, I guess, in the Clitocybe genus, as well as the Clitopilus genus. So that would be the sweetbread mushroom, um, which which is actually quite a nice mushroom to eat. So. The cap is white color and, and kind of shiny, and it's convex, flattening out and becoming depressed to funnel shape, though somewhat shallow usually, and then often retaining a small umbo in that depression. And you can see that's starting to happen here, um, especially on the right-hand side there. Uh, they are smooth and silky to the touch. The margin is smooth to lobed and wavy. And then these grow up to about four inches in diameter. And here is uh, here's a size reference for you. Go back there. The gills are white, turning cream with age. Uh, they are a decurrent, which is kind of what you see with the clitocyte genus. It's almost always the case. They are very somewhat crowded. And uh, there are frequent short gills. You can see them between the gills there, quite a few of them. And then this has a pinkish white spore print. 
The stipe is white in color. It is cylindrical, so about the same width throughout its length. It has a central attachment to the cap, and then it's up to about three inches high. And if you're familiar with funnel mushrooms, there's a lot of funnel mushroom species that look just like this. Uh, the ecology is saprobic. It is terrestrial. It is found in both grasslands and woodlands, so um, fairly common uh, with, a, with a very large range in Saskatchewan. And then it would be solitary to scattered when you do find it. Uh, you're not going to find large groupings of them and they're found summer through fall and you can see uh, this one here is actually very funnel shaped and it's got a bit of a wavy margin too there i don't think i mentioned that almost kind of crimped the toxicity is is quite extreme these are potentially lethal uh, they have killed people uh, they contain very large amounts of the toxin muscarin so once again, those symptoms, they include excessive salivation, sweating, tears, abdominal pains, diarrhea, dehydration, blurred vision, labored breathing, and that's the big one there, and heart palpitations, that's the other big one. And then of course, death. If you have, especially, imagine if you had both asthma and a heart condition, and then you had this mushroom and those symptoms lasted for one to two days. You know, that could be uh, devastating. Or if you were elderly or very young. Uh, the next one that we're going to look at is the sweating funnel. This is Clitocybe dilbata. Um, you can also consider this to be Clitocybe uh, rivulosa. They are two different species that look identical to one another, both of which occur in Saskatchewan. I'm only going to mention one though, because if you see one, you can just, it doesn't really matter which one it is. Stay away from it. Um, again, it bears a strong resemblance to um, many, I guess, whitish agarics, but particularly other funnel mushrooms and uh, the, the sweetbread mushroom. So this cap is ivory, kind of tanning slightly and in the middle and developing faint concentric rings with age. It is convex, flattening out and developing a central depression with age. And you can see that's starting to happen there. If you run your finger across the top, it will have a smooth surface. The margin is smooth and sometimes kind of lobed and wavy. And then it's up to about three inches in diameter. Here is a size reference for you. One thing to mention too is that it's often eccentric in terms of its profile. You can see that happening here. And that's one way in which you can really confuse this for the sweetbread mushroom. The sweating funnel's gills are white to grayish with age. And you can see there's kind of a gray tint to what we're looking at here. Uh, it, they are adnate to decurrent. So I've only ever seen funnel mushrooms decurrent, but uh, from what I've read, they can simply come across and touch, but uh, I've never seen it myself, but I will include adnate there. Uh, close to crowded together, uh, so there is a bit of variation there as well. Short gills are frequent, you can see them there, uh, three to four between each gill, and then this produces a white spore print, as do many funnel mushrooms. The stipe is white in color. It is clavate to bulbous. You can actually see a couple there that have fused together at the base and form that single basal mass, kind of underground. Uh, these have a central attachment to the cap. Uh, I should probably say they could also be eccentric because if you have an eccentric profile on your cap, you can basically assume that it can be eccentrically attached to the stipe. And then the stipe is up to about two inches high. So not the largest mushroom out there. These are saprobic. They are terrestrial and found in grassy areas. They are scattered to gregarious. And you can see them all here. They're kind of sometimes clumping together as well, but they often form fairy rings. And these are found summer through fall. In terms of their toxicity, these are potentially lethal. They contain, once again, large amounts of the toxin muscarin. And that is a toxin that runs in the funnel mushroom 
genus or, or genre, particularly cladocybe, um, and, and is present in, in quite a few of them. And there are a lot of funnel mushrooms in Saskatchewan. So I'm not going to run through those symptoms again. You can read them there. The next mushroom we'll be looking at is the yellow stainer, and this is Agaricus xanthodermis. And if you recall from our field mushroom presentation, these bear a strong resemblance to pretty much all of the Agaricus mushrooms, except for the ones that are found in the woods and are brown. Uh, this also bears a strong resemblance to the white dapperling. So the cap is white to off-white, becoming tan with age, especially in the center. Uh, you can see that happening there. It is convex when young and then flattening out with age and sometimes becoming a bit of a bit of a depression, not much, but you can see a tiny little bit of a depression there. So if you run your finger across the surface, it is smooth, but sometimes developing very fine kind of uh, flattened scaling and has very thin flesh. The margin itself is smooth or appendiculate if it has uh, fragments of the partial veil still left on it. And the margin also uh, bruises if you, if you push your finger into it or scratch it. It bruises a highlighter yellow. And we're going to see that yellow in some of the upcoming slide or some of the upcoming photos here. And then these grow up to about six inches in diameter, so it can get quite large, and that's a, a range that covers most of the agaricus species in Saskatchewan. Here you can see a size reference. You can see the partial veil very well there as well. So the gills are pink, becoming chocolate brown with age. Uh, they are free from the stipe, they are crowded, and then short gills are present. Uh, they are covered with a very thick membranous partial veil when young that has a double-lipped connection to the stipe. So that's a, a very good way just upon you first picking the mushroom to tell you what mushroom you have. And then this produces, as with all agaricus species, a chocolate brown spore print. So once again, that spore print will not help you. Here is the partial veil. It has a very unique look to it. You can see how indented it is at the uh, connection to the stipe with that double lip happening. The stipe is white to off-white, turning tan or brown with age. It is cylindrical. It has a central attachment to the cap. It is very solid. And then once again, it is staining a highlighter yellow uh, at the base, especially when cut. And it grows up to about six inches high and two inches thick. So when I say cut, you would want to check, if you're picking agaricus species, you always want to check um, by cutting the mushroom from top to bottom longitudinally and you need the base of the stipe. So for people who say they cut mushrooms when they're picking them, you could potentially eat a, a very toxic mushroom by not including the base of the stipe in, in your pick. And here you can see that highlighter yellow down in the bottom right. Now that annulus is double-lipped, you can see both lips there, and it, the annulus also stains a highlighter yellow if it's bruised. And there you can see around the, the rim of that one mushroom on the bottom left, uh, around kind of the margin area, uh, that staining, that bruising, of that very almost urine yellow or highlighter yellow. Uh, the ecology is saprobic. These are terrestrial. They are found in grassy areas, urban areas, and sometimes forests. Having said that, the mushrooms that are in the agaricus genus in the forests tend to be very heavily scaled. Uh, these are solitary to scattered, and they are found summer through fall. Their toxicity is moderate, so it won't kill you. In fact, there are a small number of people that can actually eat this mushroom without ill effect. Most, however, will get sick from uh, the fennel that it contains. 
it smells strongly of fennel and that is a very similar smell to pen ink uh, especially if you're smelling the base of the stipe i've also heard that uh, if you want to know for sure put this in the microwave for a few seconds and that chemical smell will be much greater um, and then consuming this mushroom would cause vomiting cramping and diarrhea and that would last for maybe up to a day and that's everything so um, I do hope you stay safe with mushroom picking and I hope that this presentation is enough to help you do that and this is the Mushroom Wizard. I will see you again next time. Thank you.